God's grace is all you need for a life of hope and joy. We are so grateful to be a channel of His grace for you through these inspiring words from Tony Evans and Dayspring. There are many people in this room this morning who are being controlled by a stronghold. You are at war personally. In the weeks to come, we're going to talk about your family war, perhaps church, member conflict. There's certainly societal conflict, but none of that matters if you can't fix what's wrong with you. Many of you today are at war. You have a fortress. You have been captured. You are a POW, a prisoner of spiritual war. Satan has got you and everything you have tried has not been able to get him to let you go. Some of us are obviously incarcerated by the evil one. Drug addiction is a stronghold. It's where your flesh has been captured by a chemical agent so that it craves it and no matter how much you try, you can't let it go. Some are codependent. There are people or a person in your life who has captured you and who holds you hostage. For some of you, it could be parents who have long since died, but whose influence in the way they have raised you has not allowed you to go free. Some of you entered into the Christian faith abused, incest, rape. Some of you ladies were brutalized by a relationship that has left scars not only on your body but on your soul. And Satan has been able to capture you and hold you hostage because no matter how hard you run, you've not been able to break away from that vice grip that holds you hostage. That's a stronghold. Some of us don't have obvious strongholds. They're private strongholds. We have them. We've just been able to cover them. They're strongholds of the mind. Sexual addiction, pornography, for example, is a stronghold of the mind. Where... Illicit activity captures our minds, and we're unable to unlock ourselves from it. No matter how many times we say we're not going to buy the magazine, we keep buying and keep thumbing through it. No how many times we say we're not going to watch the show, we keep turning it on because we have been captured by a stronghold of the mind. What is a stronghold that we went over some weeks ago? A stronghold is a mindset that accepts a situation as unchangeable even though we know it's against the will of God. That's a stronghold. Something that captures you and you see no way out. You're caught. But you want to escape. It is unfortunate that Christians have been duped into believing that if you have a stronghold, you're supposed to have it. That there's no way out. I have tried to explain for all of us that we are in a war that's run by angels. Your battle is against angels, not people. We want to blame people for our strongholds. People cannot make something a stronghold. They can set you up for you to make it a stronghold. Because what makes a stronghold a stronghold is that it's got your mind. And while people can make it accessible to you, while people can encourage you in it, they cannot force you. It's like the man who said, my wife made me hit her. No, she didn't. She just set it up for your lack of self-control to express itself. 
A stronghold is where you are captured in your mind. People say, well, if they didn't have all that junk on TV and all that junk in the movies, I wouldn't have my problem. No, you don't understand. Your problem is your problem. The TV just sets you up so it can reveal how messed up you are. And we want to spend time blaming others rather than getting rid of the stronghold that we have. It's spiritual. And one of the reasons that you haven't been able to get rid of it is because you have not addressed it spiritually. You cannot fight a spiritual battle using weapons of the flesh. You can't do it. That which is born of flesh is flesh, John 3 says, and that which is born of spirit is spirit, and never the twain shall meet. And so my task is to try as simply as I know how, for my benefit and for yours, for us, to address the question, how do I overcome, in light of all that I've learned about spiritual warfare, the personal stronghold in my life, or if you don't have one, how you can help another brother or sister or family member who knows Jesus Christ to overcome a personal stronghold in their life, a mindset that sees as unchangeable that which is against the will of God. Number one, the first thing you must do if you're going to get out of the vice grip of the mind that is holding you hostage, no matter what it is, is to remember your position in Christ. That little statement can set you on a road of deliverance that you can't imagine. That little statement can set you free from things that have been dogging you for 25 years. No matter what other help you get, if you do not remember your position in Christ, then you are barking up the wrong tree. Let me review your position. Ephesians 2, 6 says this. He has raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ. You have been elevated to a position with Christ who is now enthroned over the heavenly realm. And that's where you are. He says in light of that in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, If then you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things which are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things on earth. We have too many earthly Christians, and that's why we don't have more supernatural deliverance. If your mind is set on an earthly solution, then you won't be able to get a heavenly response. He says Jesus Christ is not down here. He has been raised and enthroned in heaven. And therefore, heaven must be the place where you access your solution. Why? Same book of Colossians says in verse 9 of chapter 2, for in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Jesus is God. And in him, you have been made complete. He is the head over all rule and authority. He oversees the angels, good and bad. Verse 15 says, and he has disarmed the rulers and authorities. He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Jesus has already beaten the devil. The devil and his angels are the source of your problem. If you are going to beat the evil environment that is the source of your problem, you have to hook up with somebody who can whip them. And you can't. 
So then what does it mean to remember your position in Christ? Here it is. Your position as a child of God, if you're truly saved, in Jesus Christ, get this now, gives you legal authority over Satan. See, see, you're not praying with me. Your position in Christ, having been raised with him and seated with him in the heavenly places, gives you legal authority over the angelic realm. Legal authority. Jesus Christ has granted you, listen to me, legal authority so that you can simply tell the angelic realm that attacks you, you no longer have any rights over my life. And I bet you a lot of us have never tried that. We have never tried stating when under attack that that is an illegitimate attempt to place on me that which you have no right because I have been legally set free by Christ. That simple remembrance of your position. Satan does not want you to remember that you've been elevated higher than him in Christ. He doesn't want you to remember that. Because if he can get you to forget who you are, then he knows you will never call on your legal rights. You have legal rights in heavenly places, and it's terrible to have a law passed on your behalf that you never benefit from. You have legal rights in heaven. Let me illustrate what I mean. Last week, I was watching a football game. And one of the players got upset at a referee for a call that he made. The player was twice as big as the referee. Probably ten times as strong as the referee. And he was angry and he went at the referee. And he did the unthinkable and the unacceptable. He bumped him. And they have gotten very strict. You don't put your hands or any part of your body on the referee or the umpire, depending on what sport it is. When you touch him, he has legal rights. Even though he's smaller than you, even though you're bigger than him, even though you, you've got on all this equipment and all he has on is a T-shirt and a pair of pants. The referee reached in his back pocket, pulled out a yellow flag and flung it up in the air. Started waving his hands up and down like this. And sent the player boogieing. Told him, you are out of here. But wait a minute. How can a little puny guy who can't lift half the weight of the football player who has no equipment to protect himself. How dare he throw a flag up in the face of a 300 pounder? Where did he get the power? Where did he get the strength? Where did he get the confidence? It was all legal. It had nothing to do that he was stronger than the player, more built than the player, more protected than the player, had more weight than the player. He just had more legal authority than the player. Brothers and sisters, Satan is bigger than you. He's been lifting weights longer than you. He's got on more equipment than you. But you got a flag in your back pocket based on Jesus Christ. You have legal rights. And when the umpire threw, when the ref threw the flag, you heard nothing more from the player because the power of the ref legally was more potent than the strength of the player physically. And the power of the believer who uses his legal right in heavenly places is more potent than the power of Satan. You have legal rights. We not only use our, don't use our rights, we forget we even have the flag in the back pocket. 
And so we have the right to say to the evil one, when he brings up our past, when he tells us we can't help it, you liar. You a liar. You are a liar because I have legal, I got papers. Colossians 2 says, Jesus has triumphed over you and I'm with him. I have legal rights. Remember your position in Christ. You have rights now in heaven. Satan don't want you to remember that because he knows he must respond to that authority because it comes from Christ. Secondly, while you remember your position, you must rely on God's provision. Turn with me to James 4. Now watch this. James chapter 4. Let me read verse 6. But he gives greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Do you remember me telling you this whole battle is about grace? Listen to that phrase. Please listen to that phrase. Please hear the phrase. He gives greater grace. Greater than what? Greater than the mess you in. I don't care what your mess is in your life. I don't care how bad you were raised. I don't care what abuse you've gone through. I'm not undermining it. I'm not saying it didn't affect you. I'm not saying it wasn't serious. I'm not saying you don't have to deal with it. All I'm saying is he gives greater grace. There is more grace than your mess. There is more grace than your problem. The way God has decided to fix the mess that we bring to him is by giving greater grace. You say, but I was abused. He's got greater grace. You say, but I was misused. But he gives greater grace. But you don't understand. I've been addicted for years. Yeah, but take up all the years of your addiction, add them together, and the verse still says he gives greater grace. God has an inexhaustible supply of goodness to overcome whatever accumulation of mess you've made. And a lot of us have more mess than we can even remember. He can take the mess you remember, the mess you forgot, put it all together, and he still gives greater grace. That is his inexhaustible supply. You must remember your position, but you must use his provision. Now, the natural question is, well, now, how do I get this grace? If, if he's given this goodness that is greater than my mess, how do I get it? He lines it out for us. He says in verse 7, submit to God. Submit to God. Submit to God. Submit to God. What does it mean to submit to God? I am submitted to God. No, you're not. Stop lying. Because if you were submitted to God, you wouldn't do what they were doing in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. What are the sources of your quarrels and conflicts among you? And the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members, you lust and do not have. You commit murder. And you're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You're not submitting to God if you're still fighting for yourself. If you're still trying to make it happen for yourself, you're not submitted to God. If you're still trying to make it, if you still get up in the morning and say, I am not going to do this anymore, you're not submitted to God, you're submitted to you. Because you're telling you how strong you are not to do it anymore. If you were that strong, we wouldn't have had a problem in the first place. We got the problem because we're not submitted to God. Now, part of this is the fault of the pulpit, and I'll tell you why. Because oftentimes the definition of the word submit is not fully given. And so if, if, if I'm guilty of that, I want to apologize and I want to give you 
the two sides of submission. If you're going to be submitted to God because you want greater grace, well, then the word submit has two components, and you have to understand both in order to submit. The first component of submit is the word surrender. Surrender. Normally, when people say submit, they use another synonym, commit. But we commit without surrender. I may give an invitation, and when I do, I say anybody wants to commit themselves to Christ, come down. And you may come down and say, well, I'm going to not do this anymore, and I'm going to not do that anymore, and I'm going to make a commitment, and you really mean it, but then you go out and fall flat on your face. Why? Because commitment can't work unless it's preceded by surrender. You say, well, what is the definition of surrender? Surrender says to God, I can't. Surrender says to God, I am unable. Surrender says, I am too weak. Surrender says, I am not able to live up to your expectation. When a man surrenders in a war, he says, I quit. <laughs> when a team surrenders, they throw up the white flag and they say, I, I lost. The Bible teaches, if you're going to get greater grace from God, you must surrender yourself. You must throw up the white flag and say, I can't. What a lot of us do when we commit is say, I can. We say, I will. I have the power to. If you had the power, you wouldn't need greater grace. It begins with surrender, which says, I am unable to fulfill that which is necessary to get me out of the mess I've gotten myself or somebody else has gotten me. I am so weak. I am so anemic. I am so unable. I fall flat on my face before you because I need help. Surrender. Because once you surrender, then God can take over. Most people don't surrender, they commit. <laughs> and what they do is try to gear up their minds to say what they're going to do in the flesh. And they treat the flesh like a lion, lion tamer trying to whip it into conformity. Not understanding that it means that you surrender. Having surrendered, now you can commit. Having told God, I can't. And therefore say to God, you can I am going to go out and not do what I used to do, not because I have the ability, because I surrender, but because I commit myself to you to supply in me that which I need to fulfill your expectations of me. You have now invited God to do for you what you can't do for yourself. Philippians 2 puts it this way. Work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. But don't forget the next verse. It says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. We want to do it ourselves and ask God to bless it. When what God wants us to say is, I can't, I messed up, I tried, I failed, give me some grace and I will. I, my ability to pull it off is tied to God's ability. We are too self-sufficient, and that's why we haven't been able to break out of the strongholds. Now, I tested this. I didn't just want to, I believe it because the Bible teaches it, but I also tested it. I tested it with two or three people in our body who had had various addictions for years. And I sat with them in my office or some other place, and I said, would you try this? These are addictions that they had for years. Years, not just a week, years. I said, would you try this? We reviewed their position in Christ. Then we reviewed submission to Christ. And in these three illustrations, within less than one month, they overcame, at least to this point, what they hadn't been able to overcome in years of addiction. Why? Why? Because God came in and did for them what they could never do for themselves by granting them more grace because they said, I can't, you can, I will because of what you do, not because of what I can do. Their surrender followed by their commitment led to their transformation. 
But some of us are too self-sufficient. And we think more of ourselves than we ought. Which I don't know why we think that, because we wouldn't be in the mess we were in if we didn't think it. And so we make one mess after another mess. No, we don't intend to do it. I'm not saying we intend to do it. We, 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 we say on New Year's Eve, I'm going to stop doing this. We really mean it. We just don't have the power to back up the word. And so we jump to conclusions like the little boy who was on a plane. He was on a, he was on a plane. There were four people on a, on a plane. There was the pilot. There was a minister. There's a boy scout. And there was a computer whiz. And there was trouble on the plane. The plane was beginning to die. So they had to jump, put on parachutes and jump. The only problem is there were three parachutes. There were four people. The pilot came and said, well, look, I got a wife and four kids. I need a parachute. So he took a parachute and he jumped. The computer whiz says, well, I've got all of this knowledge that the world desperately needs for the 21st century. And I can't have it die with me, so I need a parachute. So the computer whiz, he took a parachute, he jumped. The minister looked at the little boy and said, well, look, I've lived a long, full life, and you're just a young man. You take the last parachute, and I'll go down with the plane. The little boy looked at the minister and said, Mr. Minister, Reverend, don't worry about it. The brilliant computer whiz just took my knapsack and jumped out of the plane. See, a lot of us are too smart for our britches. We think more of ourselves than we ought to. We think we are life whiz. And every time we jump out to do right, we fall flat on our face. God is saying that he has what we need to jump with. And that'll hold us on the way down. So submit to God. Involved in this submission to God is drawing near to him. Notice verse 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. There's no way to draw near to God without giving him time. Jesus said in Matthew 17, 21, some things only come by fasting and prayer. When you come into God's presence with praise and prayer, you're drawing near to God. If the only worship God gets out of you is on Sunday morning, you're not near to God. You just visit him occasionally. Let me tell you something about the devil. He's got an allergy. Anybody in here have allergies? That means certain times a year when the pollen is high, it irritates you. Your eyes run. Your nose run. You're just, you're just irritated. Why? Because the pollen has infiltrated the air so much that it is, it is choking you up. It's making you uncomfortable. It's, it's, it's allergy season and, and you feel it. Satan is allergic to praise. He's allergic to prayer. And when it starts filling the air, he can't hang around in the environment because he's allergic to us making contact with God as a way of life. He can't handle you drawing near to God. He can't handle you turning worship into a way of life. He's got to vacate the premises because he gets allergic. Some of us never have to worry about that because the pollen of praise and prayer never fills the air. We never fill the environment so he's quite at home. He never is allergic around us. Satan ought to sneeze every time he's in our presence. Because he knows we're going to bombard the environment with the praise of God and God will inhabit the praises of his people. So when we bombard the environment, we hear him go, touch it. He can't handle it because it's too much unlike what he is. Draw near to God. Human effort cannot stop a spiritual foe. Repent of your sin is the next one. Remember your position. Rely on God's provision. Repent of your sin. He says, 
In verse 8, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. We dealt with this earlier. That simply says, humble yourself enough to God to call a sin a sin. God can't help some of us because we don't sin. What we do is make mistakes. Jesus never died for a mistake. He only died for sin. Or it was how I was raised. Or it's what happened to me that my parents did. All of those things are true. But what you do, you must take responsibility for. You cannot pass the buck of sin. And we live in a day when people are not willing to own up to their personal responsibility. We live in a blame society where everybody else is to blame. And if this didn't happen years ago, I wouldn't be doing this today. And if that didn't happen years ago, I wouldn't be affected today. Well, that may have happened years ago, but that does not exonerate you from what you did today. And unless you come to God and cleanse your hands, ye sinners, unless you come to God and purify your heart, God then considers you proud. That's why he says in verse 16, he opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble says, Lord, I can, I, I can, I, I've messed up. And even though all this was in my background, I still mess up. I am not proud. I humble myself before you. If you don't do that, he won't help you. In fact, not only will he not help you, he will oppose you. He opposes the proud. Why? Because every time he sees you're too proud to come to him and confess to him where you messed up, you remind him of another person he doesn't like. It was Satan. Satan says, I don't want to, I don't want to submit to you. I don't want to humble myself before you. I want to do this thing myself. And every time you are proud, too proud to come humbly before him, too proud to, in the, in the words of a famous song, don't be too proud to beg. Don't be too proud to come before his presence and say, I have sinned. It's my fault. And I just humble myself. Why? Because when you need mercy, you don't have anything to brag about. When you need mercy, you can't be talking about who you are. God wants to talk about your sin and you want to talk about what you did good. You know? It's like a husband who hits his wife and says, well, that hadn't happened in 25 years. What that got to do with the day? Let's, let's deal with what happened today. And you must throw yourself on the mercy of God. Pride is like a beard. It just keeps on growing and you must shave it every day. By coming before his presence, cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Because God hates pride and you are proud when you don't come to him and call it what it is. We must repent of sin. Finally, you must resist the devil. Look at verse, let's back up to verse 7. Submit therefore to God. That's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is resist the devil. And look at the promise associated with verse 7. And he will flee from you. All right? Let's talk about this. Resisting the devil stuff. Because some people got devil resisting boot camps. You can actually pay money to go sign up for a seminar on how to resist the devil. Well, let me help you save some money. Okay? Or better yet, take the money you would spend and put it in the Thanksgiving offering. All right? Let's save some money. Resist the devil. Turn, turn to Peter. Turn to Peter chapter 5. A couple pages over to the right. Verse 6, same statement. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, 
that he may exalt you, that is, exalt you above your trial, above your suffering, above whatever you're going through, casting all your worry on him because he cares for you. Be sober of spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking somebody to eat up, and he's eating up your life, eating up your mind, eating up your circumstances, eating up your joy, eating up your happiness, eating up your dignity, eating up your responsibility, eating up your family, eating up your kids, eating up your meat. He just have a good old chicken eating time. He says, seeking someone to devour, what should you do? Verse 9 says, resist him. Firm in your faith. Verse 10, after you have suffered for a while, the God of all grace who called you into his eternal glory will himself, he'll do it himself, perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Resist it. You say, now wait a minute. Okay, I know that. But how? There is only one way to resist Satan. Let me say that again. There is only one way. When he comes and say, you know you got to take that drink. You know you can't help but smoke that stick. You know you can't help but pop that pill. You know you can't help but get involved in that relationship. You know you've been doing this for years. This thing is part of your mind. And he comes and says, you got to have it. you got to do it. you got to take it. you got to look at it. you got to go there. He says, resist him. But there's only one way to do that. One day he came to Jesus and said, you're hungry, you got to eat. Jesus said, but it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He took him up to the temple. God let Satan take Jesus and God will let Satan take you just to see what you're going to do with what you heard on Sunday. He took Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple and said, now you got to jump. Jesus said, but it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God or put him to the test. Then he took him to a high mountain. We saw that mountain when we went over to Israel where you could see the whole Roman Empire. And he says, now you got to bow. But Jesus says, but it is written, you shall worship the Lord thy God and serve him only. And then the Bible says, and Satan left him. Why did he leave? Because Satan can't handle the one thing that always will resist him, and that is the spoken word of God. When Satan comes up and tells you you are addicted, you tell him back. I have been raised with Christ, Ephesians 2, 6. I've been seated with him in heavenly places. I'm going to set my mind on things above, not on things below. But you can't quote what you don't know. <laughs> You can't quote what you don't know. You can't use what you don't have. Look, when Satan comes and messes with you tomorrow, or some of you in about 10 minutes, when he comes and messes with you, don't go out of this building saying, Pastor Evans said, because I can't help you. Don't go out of this building saying, but my mama said, she can't help you. But when you walk, I don't even go out walking out waving this Bible. Because that ain't going to help you. You know you just waving it and don't know none of it. You got to be able to say, it is written. You got to be able to say, but God said, you told me I got to have that, but you a liar. And the way I know you a liar is because God says, he who hath the son is free. God said, thy word is truth, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So I just want to tell you, Satan, you a liar. Your mama's a liar. Your daddy's a liar. Because the word of God is true. And Satan will leave you. Or else God is a liar. Satan either has to leave or God is a liar. Now why don't somebody put him to the test? And stop believing what you've been told. David put him to the test one day. David had an enemy that was much bigger than him. Nine foot nine Goliath. Saul was scared. The Israeli army was scared. But David said, who is this Philistine dog who would taunt the armies of Israel? 
Saul says, well, here's the armor. David said, I don't know how to use this stuff. All I know is one day a lion came after my sheep and God steered my stone so that it hit the lion and destroyed. I killed him with my bare hands. One day a bear came after my lambs and I know that God took care of that bear. Because I've seen God work yesterday, I am not going to be afraid of what I confront today. Some of you have never seen God yesterday, so you don't think he can do anything for you today. So David went out and met Goliath. Goliath said, what do you have here? You send a little boy out to do a man's job. He looked at David and said, boy, I am going to feed you to the birds. You're going to be birds food. <laughs> David says, well, let me tell you something before you start feeding me. I don't come in my name. I don't come in the name of Israel. I come in the name of the Lord God Almighty. And it's in his name that I'm going to spin this stone. It's in his name that I'm going to turn this slingshot. Now, I know how to throw a slingshot, but God's got to direct this stone because I know I only got one shot at you, boy, and I'm going to trust God. He went around and around and around and let it go. It hit Goliath in the head. He fell down. Did I like this? David walked over and took out Goliath's sword that he never had the chance to get out himself. Walked over to Goliath's head, lifted up the sword, disconnected his head from his body, and let him know, don't mess with God. Don't mess with God. You come in the name of God. You come in the name of God. So let's get rid of the strongholds. You walk out here today saying, I'm not addicted anymore. That's right. You say that's the power of positive thinking. No, that's the power of biblical thinking. I'm not, thank you, Lord. Not help me get free. Thank you, I am free in Christ. And I claim my new identity in Christ. How do you start? We'll close with this. Hebrews 4. You need more grace. Verse 14 says, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. You know you're struggling. But one who has been tempted in all things as we, yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find help, and find grace to help in the time of grace. 